All right, guys, we're about to start. All right, so this is the first part of like a two part uh, series on uh, HALO procedures. Um, that stands for like high acuity, low opportunity. Um, first off, hi, I'm Jared Ward. I'm one of the inventivists at Hoover. Uh, I mainly work down in Atlantic here covering the cardiovascular unit. So, but I do the, I do a lot of the sim training for the fellows here. Um, so this is going to be, um, on pericarditis That green blob back there is the gelatinous jello mold that I made last night. I have no idea how it's going to work. Um, but at least if it doesn't work for ultrasound purposes, it'll work to do them blind, um, which will be okay. And then when the ballistics gel that I ordered comes in, uh, we'll just redo it and that should work just fine. Yeah, I'm going to get like signed up for like <clears throat> Guns and Roses and Ammo Monthly by buying ballistics gel. Anyway, so first one we're going to go over pericarditis. So obviously this is what we're uh, talking about. Right, so somebody comes in and mainly this should probably be our primary focus um, anytime a patient hits the door with hypotension, and especially if you get any any EKG that shows sinus tachycardia with low voltage needs a probe on his chest, period. End of story, no discussion. Sinus tach, low voltage EKG gets a bedside echo. And you just need to look for fluid, fluid or not fluid. Um, but if somebody comes in in shock and you can't say that it's sepsis, um, all these patients should get should get like a should get an EFAST looking for pneumothoraces and but like mainly point of care echo and what you're looking for these are effusions blown out right ventricle dilated left ventricle and then do you throw color flow over the mitral valve um looking for reparatory mitral regurg like those are when i think of things that i look for on like a like a quick point of care when somebody's in shock like that's what i'm looking for so what is tamponade so you know your right atrium the the valve closed to the right atrium um you would have some sort so you got to think of the lowest pressure chambered in the heart is going to be affected first right the right atrium has the lowest pressure in the heart so you would imagine that any sort of right atrial collapse um is consigned for early tamponade so when cardiologists are looking at this they're looking for either a signs of ra collapse at any point in time um, and then B, they're looking for a right ventricular collapse during diastole when the pressure is at its lowest. The right atrial pressure will show up first. So that's something that may show up. It shows up on ER boards. It may show up on critical care boards. And it's like, what is the first echocardiographic sign of tamponade physiology? And it's RA collapse or it's RV collapse during diastole when the um, the in right ventricular filling pressure should approximate the right atrial pressure. That's why it collapses then. You should have almost no collapsibility of your IVC, right? Everything should be going back. So your IVC, your IVC should be dilated. Um, and then what they'll talk about in cardiology even puts more so on this is that you will have an increased uh, a, a difference in your mitral valve inflow variation. Right. You can think when the right ventricle is getting collapsed, your pressure gradient is different. So if there's a difference between systole and diastole of, uh, about how it's going across the mitral valve by more than 25 percent, it's signs concerning for early tamponade. You can across the mitral valve. Right. If you shot it across the tricuspid valve, it would be, I think, 35 percent. So it's higher on the right side than the left side. But they'll look at collapse of the RV, collapse of the RA and variable inflow across the mitral valve. And that's just because as the tamponade is there, uh, you're just not getting the crossover from right to left. Okay, all right. So you're obviously your heart sits, you know, basically behind the sternum um, uh, and on the left side. Some people are variable, maybe a little bit more midline, but most people are gonna be just off to the left side. So the markers are important because these are basically where you're going to be sticking a needle. So feel for the xiphoid process, fill the first rib, go up one, and that's the fifth rib, right? So if you're looking for a sub xiphoid, this is what you're going to see, right? And the problem with the sub xiphoid is, uh, do you see this right here? What is this? That's right. 
Sure is. And everything's flowing back. So that liver is not, that liver is going to be full, right? In talking with the cardiologist, they poke the liver all the time, right? Uh, the answer is not poking the liver. Uh, the answer is when you dilate into the liver. But if you poke through and get your, and get blood, and then you thread the catheter down, the hole that you put through the liver is quote unquote plugged. So it doesn't become a problem until you pull the catheter. So if somebody is draining just fine and then you pull the catheter and then they develop really bad abdominal pain, it can be either because A, you went through the liver and they're now bleeding into their abdomen or B, sometimes the small bowel sets up high and they've actually went through the bowel. They don't develop peritoneic symptoms because the catheter is plugging the hole. When the second the catheter comes out, now they have air that can escape and they can get really bad abdominal pain. So bowel, liver are, are the two complications going in. Notice how when you're approaching this view, the first thing you're going to hit is the right ventricle. You can also, in speaking with the cardiologist, they poke the right ventricle all the time. The problem isn't poking it, it's poking through it. So if you go in and you immediately get blood, it's okay if you like tickle the RV. It's not okay to go in and go all the way through. All right. So if you're looking at like an apical off to your like your apical four chamber view, um, you're going to see the pericardial fusion. What's this over here? What is this? Mm, we're a little too high. Lung. So if you go apical and you're not right, you're going to drop the lung, right? So that's the complication of going apical. I don't know anybody who goes apical. And then it, when you're in a short axis view, basically, what does this look like? What does the ventricle look like? What, what, uh, if you were to pull this up and get an echo image, what what uh, what view are we in? Parasternal long, right? So it's the same position for parasternal long, right? So the answer is if you rotate the probe um, and get it coming back to you, as long as you stay in line, like you're putting in a subclavian line, like if you stay in line, you'll see the needle point come into the mm -hmm. space. You just have to be in the same plane. If you're to, to the right, to the left and you're not in plane, then you're basically poking in blind, right? I've seen some of them put drains in this way. So mainly it's either the parasternal view where you can, you're coming in line, so you're seeing your needle tip all the way in, or it's sub xiphoid, which even the best of us, it's kind of a blind process. Sub xiphoid is by far the most common. No, I'd, I'd rotate it. So I I would almost one like 180 the probe or you're going to just come in from behind the marker and you're just going to have to like gauge looking where the marker is to come and kind of come in at it. Because if you completely rotate it 180, instead of it being in this direction, you're just going to flip the image. And it's just going to be mirrored the other way. Does that make sense? All right, so. This is basically what a thoracentesis or a, a um, pericardiocentesis kit looks like. It, it's almost no different than your general thoracentesis kit, right? It's got a long cap, like but like the the crappy thoracentesis kits, not the Wayne Cook catheter kits, right? Basically, it's got a long needle, it's got a small dilator, and it's got a long drain. Um, wire is very small, um, and then you'll see that it has. This little guy right here, that's a three-way stopcock because when cardiology does them, they measure the um, the pressure and they want to see a pressure under five to know that they quote unquote fully got full drainage out of the pericardium. Um, and then you'll also notice that they have some electro wires here. So it's a spinal needle, a 60 cc syringe, a three-way stopcock, a flexible guy wire, a small dilator, and then a six to eight French uh, drainage catheter. So. I already told you what it was. Why is that in the kit? Just a wire, man. How are you going to? Yeah, it's an electrode. Yeah, it's an electrode. But how are you going to get the electrode from your needle into the heart? And if you did, what would it do? That's what we got pads on. I'm just going to go through the chest wall. So it actually attaches 
around the needle so that when you go into the pericardium, if you poke the needle, you're going to irritate the myocardium and you're going to get what basically looks like a like VTAC or a bundle branch block. So if you attach this through the, if the needle goes through this, right? And then you plug it basically into your one of the like the single D tracer monitor on the screen. Whenever you're going in, if you see a change in the rhythm, you know that your needle is poking the heart. So that's aside from the fact that you're going to get blood and then you're going to have kept going like you're going to get blood and then you're going to go a little bit further and you're going to see a change when you're when you're uh, when you're tracing on this on the uh, monitor. So uh, sub xiphoid approach. So basically what you're going to do is you need to enter at a 30 degree angle until you get below the sub xiphoid and then flatten out and then you're going to come up basically aiming for the left shoulder or you're going to aim at like the mid portion of the left clavicle. It's better to aim farther to the left as opposed to more central because the farther you aim to the left, the less likely you are to hit the liver. Right, so you're coming coming in and you're going to aim kind of mid clavicle right where the heart would be. But if you're more like mid clavicle to left shoulder when you're coming in, that's the angle that you want to be. So a little bit steep to get underneath the sub xiphoid, flatten out and then advance up. OK. The steeper you go, the more straight down you're going to go and the more higher chance you're going to hit either stomach or liver. These are supposed to be videos. They're clearly not loading. All right. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. With your parasternal here, put a little bit of color probe uh, on it because you're coming very central right here. You can have funky anatomy in the mammary artery can be running right down through there. So you don't want to put it through that. So that's just another thing to, to keep in mind. OK, any questions? Jared, so a lot of people are generally using the transverse view to do any procedure, um, except those that maybe even do subclavians. I mean, like even when I'm doing subclavians, I'm using a transverse view instead of the um, long axis. Yeah. Um, so this is like one of those procedures. I'm assuming there's no way you're going to be using a transverse, a, a long. I mean, not using a long axis, correct? Yeah. There's that. If you're looking for the parasternal, there's absolutely, positively, no way. You can use a um, a, trans, a transverse axis. Now, what you could, and I have seen some of the some of the cardiologists do, is they will get this parasternal view, and they will still go sub xiphoid, because you'll theoretically see the needle come in at the top um, of your screen for the top part of the effusion. Um, and you'll just see it kind of enter the plane in a transverse view. Uh, I think, to be honest with you, you're doing this. This is like something that is in theory inside of your wheelhouse. Um, the thing is, is like if you're doing this, it's because there's nobody else around that's better, meaning that there's no surgeon, there's no cardiologist, there's no or they are in house or they're like driving in from home. The patient's like crashing in front of you. So it's either this or this or nothing, right? So what I would say is the probably the most accepted view to go in is the sub xiphoid view. Um, and that's probably the be the one that I would choose. Now, um, some of you may go places where there's a lot of interventional procedures like Atlantic Care puts in like maybe two or three drains like this a week. Uh, I've went into lab a couple of times and like done these with the interventionalist just because I was like, I'm not doing anything and like, let's go. Um, and they, to be honest with you, they just poke, right? Like, it's not like they poke any better than you poke. They just have poked this part of the body more times than you have. But it's kind of a, a relatively, like, you would think it's, like, super duper, like, oh, my God. And they're just like, map, any other Friday procedure, right? So it's it's something that you should be cautious of because we don't do it every day. But if somebody really needs it, it's this or death. Yeah, I watched them poke. It's horrifying. Um, <laughs> but 
when when you I mean like the two times I've come into the situation, th thankfully there was a surgeon, and I'm looking just seeing where I would go. And usually I found like I want to do a parasol long because I know I don't feel comfortable going with a subxiphoid just because the liver is right there. And it's like most of the times, if you want a good clean window, you have to get the liver in the window. And then uh, usually the pocket of fluid is significantly bigger uh, underneath the um, left ventricle than over the right ventricle. Um, kind of like, I mean, yeah. this view is a very good example. Your pockets can be so much bigger uh, going sub xiphoid, but it's just that you're not able to get that view comfortably. And so mm -hmm. even despite being so comfortable going sub xiphoid over the um, parasternal. So what I would say is even if you're going parasternal, you're not hitting that big back effusion. You're still hitting the small effusion that's sitting inside the right ventricle because there's no way you can get that posterior effusion. Like your catheter is not going there, right? So it's almost always looks bigger um, back there. But the answer is even like sub or parasternal, even though you're looking like that big pocket is back there, there's no way for you to access it because you can't come from behind. That's a posterior yep. fusion. It's it's unable to be obtained. So no matter what you do, you're still draining that small fusion in front of the right ventricle. Oh, interesting. Because when I've seen people do it sub xiphoid, and then the wire ends up behind um, the heart. It may, but like the but the wire is probably gonna the wire has been snaked around, right? Mm -hmm. Like the initial catheter tip didn't go there. The wire may have went there, but the like the like you're seeing everything in two dimensions. Right, the wire yeah. is going to act in a third in a three dimensional plane. So the wire, they may very well end back up there, but it's because it was able to be snaked in, which is why if you're using a central line kit, the wire on those things is way too rigid. Like that wire is way too rigid. Like they're using like the cat like the flexible catheter that they're using and they're putting in is almost one of the wires on the micropuncher kits. Right, it's a very thin, flimsy wire. Like that thing bends super easily it's not the more stiff rigid wires off of the central line so the answer is you should grab a thor kit like one of the crappy thor kits not the wayne cook catheter kits um in certain instances you can use the central line kit you just have to use the angiocath needle if you're not using the rigid metal like needle you're using the angiocath needle or you can go get a lumbar puncture kit and you would recommend the Thora kit over the lumbar puncture kit because the Thora kit, the um, yeah, I, I would, I would, yeah, I would recommend the Thora kit unless, unless there's a dedicated pericardiocentesis kit, which there, I think there are a couple in the hospital. Um, you just have to ask for it because it has to come up from, it comes up from uh, central supply. There is a kit, um, but in a pinch, if somebody's like truly coding. Like either A, grab a central line kit, or B, tell them to grab a thoracentesis kit because that's what people are going to be more comfortable and know how to grab. All right, so next question then. Um, patient is coding. Patient is in C active CPR going on. During the um, break, you put the probe on. You see a large pericardial effusion. Um, you resume compressions. How are you getting set up to do your pericard pericardial synthesis during a code? Uh, to be honest with you, it's with a butt ton of betadine on the chest and you're just going to poke with the needle, right? Because like the patient's coding, the answer is like you got to get the needle in as fast as possible. And what I would do in that instance is I would grab the angiocath needle off of the central line kit. Um, I would go in with that and I would have a 60 cc syringe. So once you go in and you get blood back, I would basically park my hand right on the chest, not move even a millimeter and just a try to just draw back as much blood off as I can. Um, the in thin patients, you should probably be okay to go in, get blood, and then thread the angiocath needle in. In obese patients, a your needle might not be long enough, and then b um, in super muscular people or like super obese people, um, their musculature of their abdominal their muscle their abdominal wall that it may kink off the catheter. So just because you thread the catheter tip in doesn't mean that the their surrounding tissue isn't going to pinch off the and, and, and cut off the catheter. 
So, I mean, two things that you said, I think, were important, right? Like the one is that you're no longer trying to put a full catheter in. You're not doing the full procedure. I mean, the patient's in arrest. So even if you grab that huge 60 cc um, syringe, you can get hopefully enough out on your first attempt to uh, get blood out. And then after that, you can put it through. So because my concern with the central line angio catheter is it's not long enough. It probably and that's the thing. It's probably it's probably not. But in in like if you're if somebody's like coding in CAT scan or they're coding in front of you and you put a probe on them and there's a big effusion, it's going to be absolute chaos to have somebody run and grab a Thor kit. I, so I would tell them to grab both. They're most likely going to come back with a central line kit first because that's what people know about. And yeah. from there, I, I would just go for it. Like like scrub Thor like scrub the chest down and go awesome. for it. And, in these instances, if it's a large effusion that's accumulated over time, the patient probably won't have to compensate it in front of you because people can have liters, like or at least more than a liter in their pericardium if it develops over time. In a short amount of time, it's going to be much smaller, but even getting 10 to 20 cc's off in that instance can basically like reestablish hemodynamic stability. The right ventricle hasn't had enough time to become to become like fibrosed and muscular. So that it in these large like chronic effusions, um, there's enough time for for body to, for the body to compensate. Cool. I've seen it done before. I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but in trying to make sure that they correct, in trying to give themselves the best chance of trying to get this effusion out during CPR, they stopped compressions to get this uh, fluid out and then resumed compressions, and it worked. So you stop. Comp- yeah. So the answer to that is. I would treat this almost as a trauma arrest, right? Uh, when somebody comes in from like a trauma, it's almost never the heart that stopped before the trauma. I mean, it can be. People can have a big MI and then wreck their car, right? But the more common thing is somebody wrecked their car and has blood in their belly or a big pneumothorax or a big hemopericardium from the trauma. And in those instances, the procedure always overtakes the resuscitation because it doesn't matter how much you do. If you find a big like pericard like 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 hemopericardium, right? The heart is no matter epi and chest compressions is going to get that heart to start. Blood's got to come out. So I do agree that I I probably would take the time to go for the procedure, but this is not a sterile procedure, right? This is like betadine as much as you can down, have sterile gloves and go for it, and then put them on antibiotics afterwards. Right. And but the answer is you should either you should have blood out in like. 10 to 30 seconds, if you can't get it out in 30 seconds, resume compressions, switch operator and go again. Right. This is not like this is not like, a oh, I don't know where I'm going, blah, blah, blah. Like it, they're dying or and or dead. So. So in those scenarios, you still look a sub type of view or do you go? It depends, right? Like if they're big and fat and you can't get a good window, but there's definitely an effusion and you're having difficulty getting in because your needle isn't long enough, then I probably would switch to a parasternal view, right? If there's still a big view effusion on the pericardial on the parasternal view, I would poke in that direction, right? It's all it all it all depends upon. And it's very nuanced into like what is in front of you and what are your chances for success. Right. And so I would optimize my change for success. I would probably always start sub xiphoid because that is the most common view. Uh, and to be honest with you, I think if you went a different view and you had a complication, people would say you went rogue. And it wasn't like the standard like view that everybody uses or the standard quote unquote procedure. I feel like going sub xiphoid because this is not one that we do very often. Our complication risk is in general a little bit lower than a big pneumothorax or something like that that's going to complicate the arrest. Because if you go through the liver or you go through the bowel, neither one of those are going to kill the patient immediately. But going through and dropping the lung and now having a pneumothorax on top of like hemopericardium is going to complicate your resuscitation. So I would start sub xiphoid unless your needle or whatever you have access to isn't long enough to go through. And if there's a big effusion and you're assuming that this is the etiology of the arrest and you're unable to have anything else, I probably would then go sub xiphoid or I would go, I'm um, sorry, peristernal. But that would be the uh, like always sub xiphoid. If I can get a longer needle, try to get a longer needle. If I can't get a longer needle, then I would go peristernal. Cool. 
Sweet. Thanks, man. And like I said, this is one of those like high acuity, low opportunities. So none of us are going to be masters at this, right? Unless you sit in a cath lab and do these with the interventionalist, which you can uh, on your off days, like and get like procedurally sound at these. Like this is one of those things where I would do what's in the patient's best interest, but I wouldn't put yourself in a position that somebody's going to be able to Monday morning quarterback you, right? If you go sub xiphoid, if you go with the longer needle, if you try the shorter needle first, because that's what you got and the patient ultimately expires, you followed a real like a logical progression of I did everything I could to save the patient and I didn't go out with outside of the boundaries. Whereas if you start with like some harpoon and you go parasternal and even if you get ROS, but you put the catheter into the left ventricle or into the right ventricle, even if you get ROS and then the patient has to go for an operation, you're probably still OK because like the patient didn't die, but like you opened yourself up for somebody to be like, oh, as an expert in this procedure, I would never go in that direction, right? Like that's why I'm saying like, yes, this is like a do or die scenario, but that's still not without legal risk. Not to scare you. Hmm. All right, any questions? All right. All right. Let's see if 